up at Metal Shop's backstage pass. Uh, this is a, a guy that we've talked to in the past. He's uh, from a sick death metal band from Portland called Vitriol. And uh, he also has been making some really, really cool guitar straps for his own company called Steelweather. Uh, Kyle Rasmussen, welcome back to the show, man. How you doing? Thanks a lot for having me. Doing great. How about right. yourself? Doing pretty good, man. Doing pretty good. Uh, it's, you know, been a weird year, but it seems like we're kind of starting to see uh, glimpses of hope. Um but uh, I guess just just jump right into it. Like, how have you been, man? Uh, you guys were on like one of your biggest tours you guys had done with Abysmal Dawn and, and Vader. And then the world kind of, you know, it's happened. Really the, the, yeah, exactly. The pandemic happened. Um, first off, tell me about how that tour went. And then, um, you know, what have you been up to since? The tour was great, man. I mean, we did a string of, you know, we basically did hit three of them hard in a row. Uh, and we're glad we were able to um, promote our debut album to some extent. You know, we're, I think we're all just really grateful that we, we got the tours in. Yeah, you know, we could. Uh, it would have been devastating to, ha- to, to have not been able to promote that at all with, a, with live performances So for the first year. So being able to get two European tours and U S tour in, it felt really, um, um, you know, like we got, we, we were able to, uh, uh plant the flag somewhat mm-hmm. and coming home, the loss of momentum sucked, you know, it was felt by all of us, but at the same time, uh, we were also very, very tired. You know, we, we had yeah. worked so hard on that album and, uh, to make that first tour with Nile and Hate Eternal happen, we had to go straight out of that. I was coming from some personal health stuff uh, mm-hmm. right after that. And so as much as we all wanted to keep going, because that was our priority, it, it, it ended up being a little bit of a blessing in disguise that we were able to come home and, and rest. And it also gave us an opportunity to jump right into writing for the next yeah. Yeah. Uh, release, which would have take, you know, we probably wouldn't even started that by now. And, uh, and we're well, uh, well uh, into it at this point. So is that, uh, something that you've teased yet to the listeners or is this kind of, you know, just is, has there been any official like release date or anything, or is it all pretty much just still in the writing process? Still in the writing process. Um, we're, like I said, pretty far into it. We just started work on the eighth track. There's going to be nice. 10 on the full length. And I can give that information. Uh, but that's not going to be the first thing you'll hear from us. Well, we're actually in the process of, here's an exclusive announcement. I All right. Yes. Yeah. But we had um, an EP before our EP that was, that went by the title Antichrist that came out in 2012. Okay. Promote that. Um, because we didn't feel like it was, we really wanted to give that or 2017 EP or uh, 18 EP painful to find their death, kind of the, the high, the spotlight for a moment. Yeah. We didn't, Cause that was our current, that's kind of our current manifestation. So we mm-hmm. really wanted to be in the forefront, but now that the album has had, you know, our full length album has had a, a year plus to, um, move around and be heard. Uh, I was approached by a friend, Simon, who runs a little independent label called total dissonance worship. Okay. Uh, he was a fan of the band and he was like, man, what do you think we do? Uh, we do like a limited deluxe, like seven inch of that, the first EP. Uh, so Adam and I are actually going to go retract some vocals for it. Uh, oh, that's cool. Out. Yeah. Get a, give a remix on it. So it's a little, less that you know we wanted to do something that wasn't just oh here's a you know a 10 year old piece of music yeah uh, that we haven't touched so uh so that will be coming hopefully um we will be announcing a release date for that in the somewhat near future that's that's awesome but also like i can imagine uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for you, but I can imagine over 10 years, you've probably pr- progressed and, and your, 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 maybe even your taste has grown a little bit. Is it hard to go back to those songs and not want to just totally reimagine them? 
Yeah. Uh, at one high, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like for, I mean, that's what took so, you know, we really fought with the idea of, I think our creative egos definitely got in the way of the idea of trying to release it at all. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of had to come to the, to the consensus. I was like, man, you know, we did it. We, we need to, there's no, we are where we are now. We were where we were then. There are some people that appreciate this. If nothing else, you know, there are people that are still fans of that. And uh, again, if nothing else, it will help show uh, people uh, illustrate more of the journey you know, and just let it be what it is. I think we're all a little concerned about, we don't want it to be received as new because uh, we do feel like it is a bit of a regression uh, in terms of where we are now, but there are some, um, uh, so uh, we even wanted to go in and and rework some of the guitars, but the budget was such that, I was like, and it's probably for the best. It's probably for the best. You know, it's easy to overwork that stuff and you should just let the past be the past sometimes. But no techno remixes, right? Like that morbid angel, the techno yeah. remix album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the David Vincent uh, remixes here. Okay. All right. Just checking. Um, okay. So you are always sharing like sick guitars on your, your Instagram feed. And, uh, what is your guitar collection like these days, man? It's got to be massive. And then also what have been like your most recent either purchases or trades or acquisitions? Um, what are you looking at? Um, it's, it's bittersweet to think about those things. Cause honestly I was, uh, when I started doing the band full time, the acquisitions pretty much stopped mm-hmm. because I walked away from my job. Oh, okay. Uh, Fair enough to do that. Uh, but I have managed to not have to sell or hemorrhage many. Um, but I am getting, um, my, my guitar collection is still very healthy. I think I have, I have to count right now. Let me think. I think I have about 19 guitars still. Okay. Nice. Um, but I, the company that I work with, um, very closely demon S guitars, mm-hmm. uh, who built my last main one that I played on tour. Uh, we're working on my, uh, for the next album, um, full custom. Uh, it's, I actually designed it. Uh, so it's out there. It was kind of like the mission statement was I want to take all of the, because as you said, I post a lot, not all the guitars I post on my page are mine. A oh, okay. Lot just other people's or ones that I appreciate or whatever. So, um, but I'm, I consider myself an unofficial expert on the pointy guitar. <laughs> oh dude. Yeah. So I, I, was like, I was like, I want to be able to do something with all of this, all these opinions and all of this, this hands-on understanding of what makes these guitars great. What makes many of them not so great. Okay. You know, Cause a lot of point they become a controversial thing in the, in the guitar player community for a reason. You know, some of them are done really well and some of them are totally fashion over function and are a nightmare to play. So I was like, what can I, I want to take synthesize, distill all the best elements of what makes a, a more radically shaped guitar actually superior in a lot of ways for me functionally. And then, uh, modernize it for the for the player the actual yeah. player not the guy who just wants to a crazy looking guitar but the guy yeah. who wants a guitar that will play to the absolute limits without compromising its looks and i think that i feel very confident that i've designed the ultimate pointy guitar the ultimate pointy guitar that's badass man i feel like you have like a really good skeleton here for what would be an amazing YouTube channel. There's like awesome gear channels. Like, uh, uh, my homie fluff does one riff spears and gear. Um, I feel like the pointy guitar guy where you just rate and review pointy guitars and talk about all elements of pointy guitarness would be killer. It would be very niche, but the people who love it would love it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's hard for me to, uh, cause I've even recently took a bit of a break from social media mm-hmm. from that Instagram page because I myself am kind of at this, uh, 
you only have, you have a finite amount of time. Mm-hmm. And you want to make sure you're investing that time in the right things. And for me, I'm very passionate about guitar playing and pointing guitar, but I'm definitely more passionate about the music that they make and, and extreme metal music and all that. So yeah. for me, I think I found myself at a place where I'm like, I want to make sure I'm still championing the art more than the tools of the art. Sure. And I found myself in a place where I don't think I was striking enough of a balance that I felt comfortable with. Yeah. Um, So, you know, reemerging, finding a way, like, I don't want to step away from the community and the the enthusiasm for Mm -hmm. the guitars and everything, but I definitely want to um, uh, make sure I spend time um, promoting why I love those guitars. And it's because of the, pe- the, the people who play them and the riffs that they make. I can I can relate in a way. I'm I'm not a guitarist myself, but I'm all I'm um w- I listen to a lot of podcasts at my day job, and I listen to a lot of podcasts about music. And after a while, I find myself being like, I love listening to podcasts about music, but I also want to just listen to music. So I have to like forcefully just be like, okay, I'm gonna stop. Like you know listening to people talk and wax poetically about these songs and just go out and seek some music and actually just listen to some music and, and be uh, inspired by some new music. So, eh. exactly. And I think that that's a great way of illustrating this kind of duality that people sometimes, and sometimes people get stuck in, in one argument or the other. And that's where, you know, in the back, back in the context of guitar, you get the people, the minimalists that are like, Oh, it's a fuck gear. It's just, you know, like, only people that, that can't play concern themselves with that. And then there are people who lose themselves so deeply. And like they have this pedal board with 76,000 pedals and, but they haven't, you know, written a song in six months because oh. they're too busy playing with toys. And yeah. it's like, yeah. you got to find the balance. You got to find that sweet spot. Cause these toys can be deeply inspiring. Mm-hmm. Like even a new guitar shape can be inspiring. I can vouch for that. Like I, just the physics of a guitar can inspire ideas from you and a new pedal can absolutely do that. But you have to, it takes so much tremendous personal responsibility to be able to exercise that discipline and say, I'm going to have my fun, but I also need to take my medicine in a way, Yeah, you know, and, uh, being li- writing about music and listening to music. Oof. That's one of the classic li- you know, and you can tell it's so easy to tell for those of us that listen to a lot of music, like the, the, the people that write about music that spend more time writing about it and listening to, listening to it, you know? Yeah. I, no, I totally understand. And, uh, you know, honestly, and, and this isn't something I imagined um, I would even bring up with you, but I used to do reviews of, of albums and, and CDs and whatnot. And, and I actually, I still appreciate and totally am down for music journalism, but I felt uncomfortable moving forward with it. And maybe it's because I didn't have as much skill as I thought, but in my mind, uh, I kind of stopped because I felt like I'm not a songwriter. I'm not a musician. I've never put anything out there. So I didn't feel comfortable critiquing other people's art when I haven't created, you know, like I could call someone uh, like a crowbar clone, but I've never yeah. started a crowbar clone band. So I don't know. I've never you know, I'm not a musician myself, so I didn't feel comfortable doing that. And there are people who can do that. And, and that's and that's great. But I just didn't. um you know, I just felt kind of weird about it. So, but that's another thing. Yeah. I think that there's that's a no, very noble concern to have that. I think a lot of people don't, you know, have e- even sometimes enough humility to, to consider that even a line that they're crossing. But I think you can, like there are nine, nine out of 10 album reviews, I think would, would better off not existing. And it's because most of them don't observe that line in the sand. And I think great reviewers that are listeners, they understand that getting a thoughtful illustration of what a seasoned listener is receiving from something. That's the, for me, that's the role of a music journalist. If you're reviewing music, it should be, you're an expert. We hope you should be. You know, you should be if you're writing about it. 
you should be an expert. And so we're hoping to get in just almost like a film analysis. Mm-hmm. No, I don't really care what you think personally about if this movie's good or if this movie's bad. Tell me what this movie did. Okay. You know, tell me what it did to you. You know what yeah. I mean? So, and, so, and so I think people get to value opinions too much. It starts becoming this, like this, like the ratings thing is nonsense to me. This like seven out of 10, yeah. five out of 10. It's like fucking that drives me nuts. But it's like, you can tell me if you, if I'm, and stop with, and also, sorry to get on a soapbox about oh, we're Yeah, <laughs> we're, it, we're on it. Any journalists are listening to this, stop fucking reviewing albums that you just don't like. Like it wastes everyone's fucking time. Like if I wasn't going to like it, I wasn't going to listen to it. And if I do like it, your dumb pretentious ass isn't going to convince me not to fucking like it. So why don't you spend your time in a more constructive way, elevating the artists that you do like, because time is finite and it is more valuable to everyone to spend all of your time championing the things that are great. And just tell us what you think is great about it and how it moved you and not about how someone failed at doing something that they probably put more of themselves into than you did in any fucking review they can make. Nice. So it's, it's like, don't, it's one of those classic Bambiisms, man. If like, yep. if it's coming from a metal guy who spits on people at my shows, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything fucking at all. You know, that's how you get spit on. Yes. Okay. Well, okay. So going along with that, and I'm going to come back to pointy guitars here in a second, but I wanted to ask you because we're talking about, you know, music and everything and, and inspiration of music. What's the last uh, metal album that really inspired you? Oh man. Um, very recently, actually, I listened to an album by a band, a Canadian band called Panzerfaust. Okay. I've seen the name. I haven't listened to it. Yeah, It's funny because I, I'll, I'll out myself here for like, I heard the name, the band name, and I brush it off because I'm like, uh, I'm like, oh, this is just going to be another like Marty clone or something. That's exactly what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, I found out they were from Canada. Okay. And I was like, oh, even more obnoxious. You know what I mean? And I was so wrong. I was so tremendously wrong. Like I was, and I'm so glad I was because their new album is, um, oh God, what's it fucking called? Not the Faustian Path. That's the name of the album. I'm going to, I need a little check. But uh, they uh, just did this thing that so managed to find a sound. I'm not going to, I can't uh, do it justice by sitting here and trying to describe it to you. But it's great. I think it's very, very good. I found the album in incredibly inspiring both musically and lyrically okay uh that's great um are you familiar with that band i i'm gonna butcher the pronunciation i'm sure nord yevel what was it J E B E L. no yeah it's crazy band it has a dudes from merkskog okay uh, and uh uh like destructor the guy that played guitar in morbid forever next okay. to Trey, he's the long red hair and the bandana that dude he's in it and then uh dominator from dark funeral nice and it's insane wiry spindly acrobatic modern black metal that blasts faster than anything i've heard oh and this the Sons of Perdition is the name of that. Uh, Panzerfaust. I'm going to look that up after the interview. Thank you yeah. for the recommendations. I was jamming the new Cannibal Corpse album. I know it's a little bit more quote unquote mainstream metal, but that's a killer album. Crushing. Yeah, yeah. There's, st- there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that's not so buried in there that, I, that, I, that has really hit me over the last year. But yeah, that new Cannibal album is... I think that's going to be their biggest album since kill. I it, I think it's their best in quite a while. And, and it's so cool to see Eric Rutan, like actually a part of like writing now. And like, it's dude, he yeah. is such a, such a beast. Oh, and you can just tell whoops, what just happened. Uh, can you still see me? 
Uh, I can't see you, but I can see a little image from, of your band at the lake or something. Yeah. Um, there you are. Uh, nice. Uh, yeah, I think his sound is just his style. It just it's peanut butter and jelly, man. I think it, like the it's. I think it's of course regrettable what happened with Pat, and we all miss mm-hmm. Pat. It goes without saying. But if someone had to take up the helm, I, obviously, Eric you know, Dan, I'm, yeah, oh, available and willing to do so. Um, Did you get to bro down with him at all? Like when you guys toured with Hate Eternal and and uh, Nile, I, I imagine that'd be pretty cool to 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 hang out with you know Carl Sanders and Eric Rattan. That's it's a pretty good couple of dudes um, to hang with. It was that was such an incredible, and I'm glad that you asked that because I'm happy I get to share this with people that are listening. Is that you know life has done it has given me a lot of reasons to become a cynical dude when it comes to people. And, you know, I've always been, uh, trusted the old adage, you know, don't meet your heroes. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of anxiety going into the show, going into it. Cause I'm like, fuck, one of these dudes just rock star me or like, whatever, like, Oh, it's just devastating. Like these guys are why I play music, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, And I was, they were just, it couldn't have been further from the truth. You know, it was just like, they were the most, it was the most inspiring tour because not only were these guys to me, like the cream of the creative crop that are these, that our genre has to offer, but they were like still so excited about metal. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're so excited about what they were out there doing and why they were doing it. And mm-hmm it was just so reinvigorating because being on lower to like being coming up as a musician, you see a lot of bands that haven't experienced a fraction of the, the success or whatever that are already jaded burnout, whatever. And then then you learn like, well, that's the secret. The secret is not becoming that. Mm -hmm. That's secret. It's not that like, Oh, what a coincidence that these guys are nice and they're at the top of their field. It's like, no, they're at the top of their field because they, they made it there because they learned to appreciate it. And they have a love, a genuine love and passion for what they do and the art that they make. And uh, they've also been doing it for so long. And it's like underground death metal that I think that they probably don't have any delusions that they're going to be rich rock stars and that they're just grinding it out. And that all bands are on the same level. If you're still like true about passion and about death metal, I mean, they, you know, they've seen the ebbs and flows of the popularity in the music and they're still doing it. So they're, they probably just, that's, I mean, you know, that's just me analyzing it. They are. I know you're dead on. You're dead on. And, and I think it's carried them through incredible hardship and, 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 but it's also like, and I'll say it, I'll I'll say it if they're listening, it's like, I think they put up with too much shit. You know, I think, I think that they've over humbled themselves because they've, they've made it, they've made it, they've, they've had to accept to accept, to expect so little. (laughs) You know what I mean? Okay. And it's like, man, like, I like some things that they're just, you know, even little things that some of the, not like, I, I don't, I'm not encouraging them to have like to treat people poorly or anything like mm-hmm. that, but the certain, certain things that they, uh, um, they still, you know, how certain venues would still, um, you'd think that Carl Sanders and Eric Rutan would get a little more preferential treatment, but they don't, and they don't mind. Okay. And, uh, I think that's great. And, uh, but man, it would be nice if we could uh, do a lot more to exalt the people that have inspired so many. And, and it would be cool. I'd, you know, I, I, I'd like to try to do that. And that's why I like to celebrate, you know, the classics a lot in, in my online presence and stuff. Cause it's yeah. like, man, some, somebody's got, someone has to, make history, make sure that history knows that these are the guys that did this shit. Cause they're too humble to say it. They're, you know? Yeah. So, okay. Well, well let's do that. Then let's talk about the classics, man. Like what is, what are the like death metal albums that got you into the genre? Ooh. Yeah. Well, it's actually funny that the death metal album, this is, this is a funny one. The death metal album that got me into death metal wasn't a good one. 
but it was, uh, it inspired me. The very first death metal song I ever heard was from six feet under. Okay. Yeah. What was, was it? TNT? <laughs> God, it was not. No. Okay. Okay. I, th- I think it was like murdered in the basement or something. It was something off of maximum violence. And it, I didn't really have any sort of opinion on the, the song at that point. I just heard Chris Barnes's vocals and I was yeah. like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Like, this is what I'm doing now. Yeah. <laughs> but as far as the albums that really, really like made me fall in love with death metal that I think are pinnacles, of the, you know, uh, for me, uh, failure for gods by immolation. Mm-hmm really really important album for me um, um despise the sun by suffocation i know that's yeah cool. a lot of people love that that ep but i that that totally seduced me and then i loved everything else that they did uh, before that uh when i went back and you know ate ate up the whole catalog yeah suffocation was a really formative band for me because they had that, um, you know, they weren't afraid to blend the the technical chops with the uh, with the slams and shit. You know? Oh yeah, and that was really inspiring for me. Nile, um, um, Annihilation of the Wicked uh, was an album that that album specifically shaped a lot of my guitar work and how I approach writing songs on the guitar. But the, I would say the one that influenced me the most as far as vitriol sound was I Monarch by Hate Eternal. Nice. Wow. Uh, okay. That album was really like the turning point where I was like, oh shit. It was like, it was the death metal for death metal fans. Mm-hmm. Cause it was dissonant and chaotic. And it didn't, you know, it was just, it was, it had more teeth on it. And, and it was scary. I remember I was listening to, I remember the um, Behold Judas music video was on uh, that fucking on-demand shit. And I'm watching my friend's apartment like 10 years, however long ago. Mm-hmm. Much ago. And he was sort of into extreme metal, but he was more into like hardcore and stuff. Mm-hmm. And we're watching this video and I'm just like, totally oh, fucked. And, and I, I turn to my friend at the time, Brock, he's like, sweat, literally sweating. He's like, he's like, he's like, dude, this gives me an anxiety. Yes. And I was like, yes, yes, this is it. Uh, so that was a, existentially, it sounds silly to say, but that album was like, there was this kind of atmosphere to it, this really oppressive trauma This just like, yeah, oh, man, it, it was just, there was this magic on that album that I was like, I don't want my music to do that. I want my music to be that, just be that visceral, mm-hmm. you know? Um, even uh, Demigod by Behemoth. Yeah. Was Great a, album. I was just, it was so muscular and mm-hmm. so um, uh, driving and unapologetic and it's how kind of Neanderthalic it was. Yeah. And it's yeah. funny that it's funny how you mentioned hate eternal like that, because I have a friend named Travis and a shout out to my friend, Travis. He is the biggest hate eternal fan that I know diehard hate eternal fan. And he told me when he first heard him, he was like, is this too extreme? <laughs> he was like, I think this might be too extreme. And then he just listened more and more and fell in love with it because it was just the most extreme thing at the time. So yeah, I mean, and they're still at it. Yeah, and that shit still is, man. You listen mm-hmm. to especially the first two albums, Conquering the Throne is to me when people I have said it in the past that like that is if I had to pick the Desert Island Death Metal album, it's Conquering the Throne by Eternal. Like that's nice. that's it. That is pinnacle death metal to me in spirit. You know, not just in yeah. sound, but in spirit. Like that album fucking hates you. That album wants you to die a horrible death. You know, like that yeah. album is so angry and does not and wants it is expecting you to feel like it's too extreme. Yeah. And that kind of punk rock fuck you. Yes, it's too heavy because that's how I fucking feel. You know, like yeah. That's that had that honesty to it that just was so 
Yeah, I still I'm, I have goosebumps talking about him, man. I fucking that he's the man. Eric Rutan's the fucking man. That's awesome, man. So, uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm curious about, um, we were talking about inspiration and, uh, I don't want to get off the subject of hate eternal, but I, I do want to ask you about, so I have a friend, um, who is in, in a, a band as well. And, and he told me we caught up recently and he told me, you know what? I haven't really been listening to music lately because I've been writing music. He said, he's been just trying to focus on his own music and not listening to other music. Um, not being a musician myself, I'm curious, uh, when you're deep in the mode of like writing music, do you, do you find inspiration from other artists or do you all, do you have to kind of immerse yourself in just what you're making? Oh man, I get inspiration from other, I have to constantly be listening. You know, I believe, I, I mean, everyone has their own process. You know, I think a lot of people create music and aren't, aren't, you know, I, I mean, I know for a fact, a lot of people create music and aren't much listeners of music mm -hmm. um, anymore. Um, but for me, it's, it's, I believe deeply that music and art in general is a conversation and that's my relationship with it. And okay. I'm, a fan first and foremost. And I became a practitioner just because I like, I heard, I knew what I wanted to hear and I wasn't hearing it. Yeah. And so it's like, and I can in that way, because my desire to create was born from an understanding of the landscape of the music. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That like, it can only sustain itself through continued observation of the landscape. Yeah. Because vitriol is more of an answer to what I, what I want to hear is a, is a devout metal fan. Um, and that changes as a landscape change. Yes. Yeah. You know? Um, so, and also like, I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't always have good ideas and I have to steal better ones from other people. Hey, I mean, there like, you go. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I mean, why else do you listen to what other guys are doing? So you can steal a shit cause it's sick. No. Uh, hopefully very respectfully, <laughs> a uh, nod, a nod there and there. Right. Exactly. But yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I just like, well, I, I mean, I think it's, I applaud the confidence of people that are like, I got it. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I, that's great. And I'm sure like a lot of great music is made that way. I'm not, I'm not, you know, being patronizing. I, uh, I just, I know my process and I think that, um, it would, I would suffer, uh, if, if I wasn't like, like eating music all the time. Nice. It's not, I have periods for sure. Especially yeah. if I find something I fall in love with, I'll immerse myself in it sometimes for months at a time. Yeah. And that'll lock off new shit. But then I'll go through like this, you know, like a, like a fucking bear going into hibernation, you know, I'll like yeah. go myself on stuff, filter it out and then go into my, you know, go and soak in it. Are you a physical media person? Are you more MP3 streaming? Do you I mean, I know a lot of, so like people are vinyl, but I know a lot of like death metal heads are CD only. They just, yeah. for some reason, death metal heads love the CDs. They will not let CDs go. And I'm one of them. So uh, what, do, what do you prefer? It's such a unique thing to yeah. death metal CDs. It's like we're yep. the only fans that like, it's so keeping it's so CDs fun. around. Yep. So funny. Um, I, I like vinyl because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a novelty, uh, guy, you know, like I, I love the big picture, you yep. know, yeah. the album art because I love everything about an album. And as someone who makes up like albums, I know how much thought goes into the entire format. Yeah. And I think musicians could, would make the argument that you're not totally, totally in taking the whole thing unless you, you have, the art and the yeah. answer. But, uh, um, with that being said, I don't really have the financial resources to be an avid collector of vinyl mm -hmm. because it's very expensive. Yeah. So I usually do my, uh, I would have like, I'd get my like top five albums of the year. Yeah. I kind of think like that just so I have kind of a memento. Yep. And, uh, I, I mean, I have listened to most of my vinyl, you know, most of it's just, I just listen to it on Spotify and, yep. I have it as a token, a party thing, you know, it's there. 
It's in case you ever, in case Spotify ever dies, and how crazy would that be if all of a sudden the entire cloud of Spotify were to die and people that sold their music collections were like, wait a second, what the hell? Yeah. Anyways, yeah, it's there just in case. Got a doomsday prep those. That's why all those slam nuts have 10,000 fucking CDRs in their basement. Speaking of slam nuts, I have a question for you, dude. And this is something specifically to Bandcamp and slam. What is it with the sick amount of slam music being produced by children in Indonesia? Dude, I think it's so funny you ask that. Because I have been kind of been my little cultural exploration lately on social media. Because while I haven't been participating that much, I'll still hop on there. Oh yeah, F- trying to find all these like it start because I remember noticing it about I want to say eight seven years ago. I started noticing some of these Indonesian this Indonesian death metal thing happening, but now it's gotten to the point where it's like these bands like. There's a, there's a, this Indonesian death metal page that's just about Indonesian death metal, and it has like half a million followers. And then like their death metal bands that are in Indonesia that like there's a band called Burger Kill. Have you heard of this thing? I have not, but it sounds great. <laughs> They're not a slam band. They've been around since the nineties. They're like okay. death metal hardcore. It's actually not that bad, but they are like. It seems like they are like fucking Nickelback in Indonesia. Wow. I don't Rock know stars. what's going on over there, but it's like, and they have this thing called Dead Squad. Okay. Which is, they have like all these like collectives. It seems like that whole country is just run on fucking death metal. Dude. Ah, oh, man. So next time when the world opens up, you need to make sure when you do a vitriol world tour, Indonesia for vitriol. Dude, I want to so bad. I'm not kidding. I mean, I think just as a fan, like as a fan of death metal, I think it's fascinating what's going on over there. Genuinely, yeah. Like not as not being funny. Like I think it's amazing. Yeah. Fascinating. How can we do that? There like, needs to be a documentary about them, like one of those like metal headbangers journey, like uh, banger films. That would be really yeah. cool to see, like in like a behind the scenes, you know, like a Vice style documentary behind the scenes of the Indonesia death metal gangs. Yeah. Dude, any movers and shakers listening, contact me, bro. I'll be your guy. Yeah. I'll go, I'll go deep. I'll go deep. I want to know. I want to see. Like, it's, they're, it seems like they're having a fucking great time. Yeah. And the music they're making is insane. You know, like, a lot of it is fucking crazy. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I'll, I'll be the guy. I'll be the dude. And I love their, uh, I don't know if all of the broken English titles, I think the broken English stuff is like a style. Okay. Of itself. Yeah. Like, so all the titles are so hilariously mistranslated. Yep. That has to just be part of it. And I yeah. love, I love that they're having fun with it. And, uh, it's just, they're, they're sick and, and awesome. It's great. Right on, man. Okay. Well, I had to throw that question in there. So I just have a couple more questions for you, but I'm curious, you look like, it looks like you're in a really cool setting right now. Is this your house or they have a really cool, um, like fan above you or looks pretty gnarly looking. I'll give you a little tour. I'll see what you see. My partner and my friend here. All right. So yes, I am in my house. It's actually in my studio room. Oh, cool. Hello. Hey, Hey, there's my guitars. Oh, uh, there's your 19 guitars. Yeah, there's some of them right there. Sick. Here's a little living room and my nice. some records and some heavy metal paraphernalia and I like it. Baphomet. Yep. Yeah, all the good stuff. And then yeah, this is this is where the magic happens. Nice. Uh, this was Death Metal Cribs, a very short yeah. version of Death Metal Cribs. <laughs> Yeah, Ooh, this man. is where the whole next Vitriol album was written and will be continued to be written. You know, uh, we got so nerdy t- in the weeds here, I almost forgot to plug uh, your company, Steel Weather. Let's talk a little bit about that. So this is, uh, speaking of like how dangerous and, and uh, those guitars that you play seem to look like, I can imagine you'd probably get stabbed if you were to move wrong with those guitars. Now add that to some of the most fierce looking guitar straps 
and that's steel weather dude so tell me about it man and like how'd you start and and uh yeah just tell me a little bit about steel weather yeah it was a it was a culmination of it was an answer to a simple question when when covid happened um and the tours weren't happening I knew I uh, had to, and my job prior to this was I was a body piercer for 11 oh, years. Wow. So obviously I wasn't going to go back to that job, right? Yeah. During COVID. So I was like, fuck, um, I'm either working at a grocery store or I got to figure something out. Mm-hmm. And I want to continue. I, I didn't want to stop talking with metalheads, I guess yeah. you could say. So, and I, um, had a passion. I have a passion for metal guitars and I was like, well, I'm not going to build guitars anytime soon. Yeah. And there are plenty of people doing that well. So, um, what had happened, I bought a big spiked guitar strap from a buddy of mine that, mm-hmm. that had 25 years, super old. And I'll, uh, people kept asking, where'd you get it? Where'd you get it? And I'm like, Oh, from a buddy. And I don't know where you can get them now. Yeah. I, the guy who builds my guitars really wanted one, and I scoured eBay for one that looked cool and couldn't find a damn thing. So I'm like, well, people seem to trust my opinion about guitars. I trust my opinion about guitars. Why not uh, do the make the other half accessorize them for people? Yeah. So uh, that's when my partner Sophia and I decided uh, that we just make them and try to figure it out. And it was hell. And it, uh, Wanted to quit several times making a strap as guitar strap is, uh, we didn't know anything. We didn't know how to sew. Yeah. We didn't know. I'd never worked with any sort of material like that before. So it was just a total dive in thing. Watching YouTube videos, how to like yeah. sat and shit, you know, um, invested in a machine. And so anyway, yeah, it was just a way for us to stay involved, contribute to the, the metal community and uh, be creative probably yeah. like during that time where it was like COVID just started, I was going crazy. I, I had to figure out a routine. Yeah. I'm glad you, I was just spacing that point, but that was a huge thing for me. It was just another way. And I was feeling, especially I remember at that time I was like, I'm so tapped on vitriol. Like I'm so like, I just have nothing in me to think about like writing a song but I knew I had all this creative energy that I needed to to do, do something with. Yeah. So this was a logical outlet and, uh, and really just our, it sounds a little hokey, but our small way of trying to elevate the whole metal guitar thing, just a little higher, you know, whatever we can do to make it taken a little more seriously. Like if people are, you know, if people are interested in, high-end handmade boutique spike guitar straps. Well, that says something, you know, that yeah. says something about the position of the people that want to play guitar like that and, and want to present and has that kind of aggressive relationship with their playing and, and the attitude of the metal guitar. And so I think it's really cool just to get that sort of validation. And if 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 you want a a a guitar strap, a high end boutique guitar strap with spikes all over it, it might be you know uh, a really cool leather. Uh, How where can people find it? Um, It is steelweatherdesigns dot com. Awesome. We're weather on Instagram, and all of our stuff is actually one hundred percent vegan. It's all made okay. uh, uh, But for the people that are concerned about durability or whatnot it's um it's all made from the same stuff like the same stuff harley uses to put on their motorcycle seats you know cool. it's high grade automotive upholstery vinyl nice. that is waterproof you know you could this i mean you you could i i still have the very first one i made you could beat that thing against a wall for a month and it's gonna survive the apocalypse so do you have one around you on hand? You could show the camera. Oh yeah. Nice dude. These things are badass. I'm stoked to see this. Oh man. He's got a bunch. Holy crap. Dude. Those are gnarly. Is that a camo? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, this is a camo. Yeah. So that's the other nice thing about the vinyls is that if you do vinyl, 
you have a lot more, we get to have a lot more fun. So we do like a, you know, faux croc, faux yeah. one, you know, all sorts of stuff. You can That's sick, man. and get creative and they last longer and uh, they all come in their own personalized ammo can, uh, oh, carry, man. which is, uh, let me grab that real quick. Yeah, I saw uh, Taylor Young ha- had one on. He posted, uh, Taylor Young posted one, and I was like, oh, I think I recognize those. I think those are Kyle's, and I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So we order these. That's sick. Straight from the base on it, uh, through the internet. And then I, all of these are all handmade completely by Sophia and I. And then I, I stencil and spray paint all these by hand. So. That's so cool. Coming straight from us. No, no middle people here. So. That's awesome, man. Hell yeah. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. Absolutely. So again, steelweatherdesigns.com. Um, yeah. Okay. Now I got to ask, have you ever been stabbed by one of your guitars or your, your strap? On I, stage? I, hand, hand to the dark Lord have never done it. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> I know it sounds like a sales, safety sales pitch, but I just haven't. It's like my maybe that day will change. That that will that fact will change. Um, but I have managed to the way that my head swings around. I headbang like a maniac too. Yep. So it's kind of a miracle. I have ripped out a few strands of hair, but uh, other than that, I puncture free. All right. Right on, man. Uh, okay. Well, so we're looking forward to the new vitriol as you're writing it. And, and, uh, my last question for you, man, uh, if you could pick a scar on your body and show us, if you can tell us the story of how you got the scar. Oh, that's easy. Nice. This one's easy. This one's fun because Uh if you look closely, I don't have a belly button. No, you really don't. Whoa. Um, this here was my old belly button, but this is just a hole. So I had, I have Crohn's disease. Oh, okay. I had a perforated intestine. So that means my shit was filling up stuff. It wasn't supposed to Yeah. It cut me open, fix it. And then, uh, it failed. So they had to do it again. And then I got, a. Uh, I have great photos of to send to you. I imagine all- my, my, ne- uh, my, uh, cousin had the same thing and they had to cut out so much of his intestines. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's bad. Like I have to say, it, that's why it's harder for me to keep on weight and put on weight and mm-hmm. all sorts of vitamins because I don't absorb the right amount of nutrition. Now it's a, and my stomach's about the size of a fucking peanut. It feels like I just have yeah. to work the appetite back up. And so it's, um, yeah, the, that was a nightmare. Three months in the hospital, and um, when was uh, that? That was at the very end of 2018. So wow. our EP was just being released. Our very first EP was just being released. God damn! And I got signed to Century Media like fucking two months after I got out of the hospital. I was still addicted to pain medication. Mm-hmm. When that happened. I was just kicking that, and then. Uh, was able to kick that by start. I had went through like all of my twenties, totally sober ended up, uh, kicking the pills by getting the weed and then, uh, went straight into the European tour, cold Turkey, no pot. Yeah. And I was like, fucking, you should ask, you should interview my bandmates about how I was doing on that fucking tour. <laughs> Angry. <laughs> Ooh, buddy. You know, like, Man, you, you, you know that that's my dream when I'm like, yep, I'm just going to fucking, because, you know, you can't bring, I was like, hopefully someone's going to have weed there. But of course, I like, I didn't want to be that new guy that's like asking people, hey, man, you know where to get Got the some weed. Yeah. yeah. Bro. So I was just like fucking sweating it. Just yeah. hot death metal for a month and uh nightmare. But it was good for me. Yeah. Clean, yeah purged that shit. But that was my long, uh, that was, uh, it's funny. We tied it all into the very beginning where yeah. I was saying wasn't great mm-hmm. when pouring extensively. And that's the whole backstory is yeah. the, I lost 
literally a hundred pounds. I was 200 pounds when I went in the hospital and I was like 98 pounds when I left. God damn. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, it was basically that trying to kick, uh, you know, after being on morphine for three months, you try to leave a fucking hospital without an opiate addiction. And, uh, the hell of that anyway you know it's much more common than people talk about so anyone listening knows either you've dealt with it or someone you know has dealt with it oh yeah um we don't you know uh so it is what it is but man that's hell yeah, it's so hard to fucking i'm sitting here anxiously like yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh you know uh but you get out uh and then you immediately go into tour and and you're signed and it's like man if this isn't something to live for, man, this is something to live for. No kidding. So, or, you know, it's every day is kind of an exercise in, in just trying to understand how to deal with that opportunity responsibly and how to communicate that gratitude responsibly to the listeners and the, and fucking the world. And it's hard, you know, you just want to, I'm very grateful very grateful and it's easy to let go of things that are hard to let go of when you, when you can feel that grateful for things. So, um, you know, if you're having a hard time out there, find something that's more important Yeah, and apply yourself to that and let it do its work. But before we go, I do want to mention you, you are on century media and, uh, how st- I would be stoked to see, you know, when the world opens up, it's a couple bands that I gotten really into, new albums on century media, frozen soul and Sanguisugabog. I would love to see a vitriol Sanguisugabog frozen soul century media world tour. That would be sick. Yeah, man. That, yeah. Those bands are killing it, man. That new frozen. Yeah. Soul. Um, uh, we played with them at a uh, gas monkey in Texas. Okay. Nice. We fucking leveled that crowd. Leveled awesome. that. They're definitely a, just a, absolutely crushing live band. So they would be, I haven't had the opportunity to see sing with Sugabog live, but, uh, uh, it would definitely be, uh, uh, a steamroller. Oh yeah. So, uh, so those guys are definitely an active physical band. So nice. cool. a lot of fun to watch. Well, I look forward to seeing them and I also look forward to vitriol and, and thank you so much for taking the time, man. I know this interview went a little longer than I probably intended to, but it's awesome to, to chat with you and to get a tour of your stuff and to even get to see your, your no belly button, belly button. Yeah, man. I really appreciate the interest in the time and I'm, I'm genuinely flattered and honored. And, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone that listened that now check out steelweatherdesigns.com and then to bathe from the throat of cowardice is the vitriol record to check